Five, four, three. Ignition. Three, two, one. Zero. Roger. Lift off. 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 This is your Colby Cast, a weekly roundup of news from the ColbyJack.net world headquarters, flavored with a healthy dose of fiction. Push a button. Hey, this is R.L. Ferguson telling you, you got lucky. There's no news this week either, because we're really boring. So we're going to go right into Edgar Rice Burroughs, A Princess of Mars, with episode four. Chapter 10, Champion and Chief Early the next morning I was astir. Considerable freedom was allowed me, as Sola had informed me that so long as I did not attempt to leave the city, I was free to go and come as I pleased. She had warned me, however, against venturing forth unarmed, as this city, like all other deserted metropolises of an ancient Martian civilization, was peopled by the great white apes of my second day's adventure. In advising me that I must not leave the boundaries of the city, Sola had explained that Wula would prevent this anyway should I attempt it, and she warned me most urgently not to arouse his fierce nature by ignoring his warnings should I venture too close to the forbidden territory. His nature was such, she said, that he would bring me back into the city dead or alive should I persist in opposing him. Preferably dead, she added. On this morning I had chosen a new street to explore when suddenly I found myself at the limits of the city. Before me were low hills pierced by narrow and inviting ravines. I longed to explore the country before me and, like the pioneer stock from which I sprang, to view what the landscape beyond the encircling hills might disclose from the summits which shut out my view. It also occurred to me that this would prove an excellent opportunity to test the qualities of Wula. I was convinced that the brute loved me. I had seen more evidences of affection in him than in any other Martian animal, man or beast, and I was sure that gratitude for the acts that had twice saved his life would more than outweigh his loyalty to the duty imposed upon him by cruel and loveless masters. As I approached the boundary line, Wula ran anxiously before me and thrust his body against my legs. His expression was pleading rather than ferocious, nor did he bear his great tusks or utter his fearful, guttural warnings. Denied the friendship and companionship of my kind, I had developed considerable affection for Wula and Sola, for the normal earthly man must have some outlet for his natural affections. And so I decided upon an appeal to a like instinct in this great brute, sure that I would not be disappointed. I had never petted nor fondled him, for now I sat upon the ground, and putting my arms round his heavy neck, I stroked and coaxed him, talking in my newly acquired Martian tongue, as I would have to my hound at home, as I would have talked to any other friend among the lower animals. His response to my manifestations of affection was remarkable to a degree. He stretched his great mouth to its full width, bearing the entire expanse of his upper rows of tusks and wrinkling his snout until his great eyes were almost hidden by the folds of flesh. If you have ever seen a collie smile, you may have some idea of Woola's facial distortion. He threw himself upon his back and fairly wallowed at my feet, jumped up and sprang upon me, rolling me upon the ground by his great weight, then wriggling and squirming around me like a playful puppy presenting its back for the petting it craves. I could not resist the ludicrousness of the spectacle, and holding my sides, I rocked back and forth in the first laughter, which had passed my lips in many days. The first, in fact, since the morning Powell had left camp when his horse, long unused, had precipitously and unexpectedly bucked him off head foremost into a pot of frijoles. My laughter frightened Woola, his antics ceased, and he crawled pitifully toward me, poking his ugly head far into my lap. And then I remembered what laughter signified on Mars. Torture, suffering, death. Quieting myself, I rubbed the poor old fellow's head and back, talked to him for a few minutes, and then, in an authoritative tone, commanded him to follow me, and a rising started for the hills. There was no further question of authority between us. Wula was my devoted slave from that moment hence, 
and I his only and undisputed master. My walk to the hills occupied but a few minutes, and I found nothing of particular interest to reward me. Numerous brightly colored and strangely formed wildflowers dotted the ravines, and from the summit of the first hill I saw still other hills stretching off toward the north and rising one range above another until lost in mountains of quite respectable dimensions. Though I afterward found that only a few peaks on all Mars exceed 4,000 feet in height, the suggestion of magnitude was merely relative. My morning's walk had been large with importance to me, for it had resulted in a perfect understanding with Woola, upon whom Tars Tarkas relied for my safekeeping. I now knew that while theoretically a prisoner, I was virtually free, and I hastened to regain the city limits before the defection of Woola could be discovered by his erstwhile masters. The adventure decided me never again to leave the limits of my prescribed stomping grounds until I was ready to venture forth for good and all, as it would certainly result in a curtailment of my liberties as well as the probable death of Woola were we to be discovered. On regaining the plaza, I had my third glimpse of the captive girl. She was standing with her guards before the entrance to the audience chamber, and as I approached, she gave me one haughty glance and turned her back full upon me. The act was so womanly, so earthly womanly, that though it stung my pride, it also warmed my heart with a feeling of companionship. It was good to know that someone else on Mars, besides myself, had human instincts of a civilized order even though the manifestation of them was so painful and mortifying. Had a green Martian woman desired to show dislike or contempt, she would, in all likelihood, have done it with a sword thrust or a movement of her trigger finger. But as their sentiments are mostly atrophied, it would have required a serious injury to have aroused such passions in them. Sola, let me add, was an exception. I never saw her perform a cruel or uncouth act or fail in uniform kindliness and good nature. She was indeed, as her fellow Martian had said of her, an atavism, a dear and precious reversion to a former type of loved and loving ancestor. Seeing that the prisoner seemed the center of attention, I halted to view the proceedings. I had not long to wait, for presently Lord Quas Potomel and his retinue of chieftains approached the building and, signing the guards to follow with the prisoner, entered the audience chamber. Realizing that I was a somewhat favored character, and also convinced that the warriors did not know of my proficiency in their language, as I had pleaded with Sola to keep this a secret on the grounds that I did not wish to be forced to talk with the men until I had perfectly mastered the Martian tongue, I chanced an attempt to enter the audience chamber and listen to the proceedings. The council squatted upon the steps of the rostrum, while below them stood the prisoner and her two guards. I saw that one of the women was Sarkoya, and thus understood how she had been present at the hearing of the preceding day, the results of which she had reported to the occupants of our dormitory last night. Her attitude toward the captive was most harsh and brutal. When she held her, she sunk her rudimentary nails into the poor girl's flesh, or twisted her arm in a most painful manner. When it was necessary to move from one spot to another, she either jerked her roughly or pushed her headlong before her. She seemed to be venting upon this poor defenseless creature all the hatred, cruelty, ferocity, and spite of her nine hundred years, backed by unguessable ages of fierce and brutal ancestors. The other woman was less cruel because she was entirely indifferent. If the prisoner had been left to her alone, and fortunately she was at night, she would have received no harsh treatment nor by the same token would she have received any attention at all. As Lord Akos Potomel raised his eyes to address the prisoner, they fell on me, and he turned to Tars Tarkas with a word and gesture of impatience. Tars Tarkas made some reply which I could not catch, but which caused Lord Akos Potomel to smile, after which they paid no further attention to me. "'What is your name?' asked Lord Akos Potomel, addressing the prisoner. Deja Thoris, daughter of Mors, Kajak of Helium. And the nature of your expedition, he continued. It was a purely scientific research party sent out by my father's father, the Jedak of Helium, to rechart the air currents and to take atmospheric density test, replied the fair prisoner, 
in a low, well-modulated voice. We were unprepared for battle, she continued, as we were on a peaceful mission, as our banners and the colors of our craft denoted. The work we were doing was as much in your interests as in ours, for you know full well that were it not for our labors and the fruits of our scientific operations, there would not be enough air or water on Mars to support a single human life. For ages we have maintained the air and water supply at practically the same point without an appreciable loss. And we have done this in the face of the brutal and ignorant interference of your green men. Why, oh why, will you not learn to live in amity with your fellows? Must you ever go on down the ages to your final extinction, but little above the plane of the dumb brutes that serve you? A people without written language, without art, without homes, without love, the victims of eons of the horrible community idea. Owning everything in common, even to your women and children, has resulted in your owning nothing in common. You hate each other as you hate all else except yourselves. Come back to the ways of our common ancestors. Come back to the light of kindliness and fellowship. The way is open to you. You will find the hands of the red men stretched out to aid you. Together we may do still more to regenerate our dying planet. The granddaughter of the greatest and mightiest of the red Jadex has asked you, Will you come? Lorquas Potomel and the warrior sat looking silently and intently at the young woman for several moments after she had ceased speaking. What was passing in their minds no man may know, but that they were moved I truly believe, and if one man high among them had been strong enough to rise above custom, that moment would have marked a new and mighty era for Mars. I saw Tars Tarkas rise to speak, and on his face was such an expression as I had never seen upon the countenance of a green Martian warrior. It bespoke an inward and mighty battle with self, with heredity, with age-old custom, and as he opened his mouth to speak, a look almost of benignity, of kindliness, momentarily lighted up his fierce and terrible countenance. What words a moment were to have fallen from his lips were never spoken, as just then a young warrior, evidently sensing the trend of thought among the older men, leaped down from the steps of the rostrum, and striking the frail captive a powerful blow across the face, which fell to the floor, placed his foot upon her prostrate form, and turning toward the assembled council, broke into peals of horrid, mirthless laughter. For an instant, I thought Tars Tarkas would strike him dead. Nor did the aspect of Lorcas Potomel augur any too favorably for the brute, but the mood passed. Their old selves reasserted their ascendancy, and they smiled. It was pretentious, however, that they did not laugh aloud, for the brute's act constituted a side-splitting witticism according to the ethics which rule green Martian humor. That I have taken moments to write down a part of what occurred as that blow fell does not signify that I remained inactive for any such length of time. I think I must have sensed something of what was coming, for I realize now that I was crouched as for a spring as I saw the blow aimed at her beautiful, upturned, pleading face, and ere the hand descended I was halfway across the hall. Scarcely had his hideous laugh rang out but once when I was upon him. The brute was twelve feet in height and armed to the teeth, but I believe that I could have accounted for the whole roomful in the terrific intensity of my rage. Springing upward, I struck him full in the face as he turned at my warning cry, and then as he drew his short blade, I drew mine and sprang up again upon his breast, hooking one leg over the butt of his pistol and grasping one of his huge tusks with my left hand while I delivered blow after blow upon his enormous chest. He could not use his short sword to advantage, because I was too close to him, nor could he draw his pistol, which he attempted to do in direct opposition to Martian custom, which says that you may not fight a fellow warrior in private combat with any other than the weapon with which you are attacked. In fact, he could do nothing but make a wild and futile attempt to dislodge me. With all his immense bulk, he was little, if any, stronger than I, and it was but the matter of a moment or two before he sank, bleeding and lifeless to the floor. Dejah Thoris had raised herself upon one elbow and was watching the battle with wide staring eyes. When I had regained my feet, I raised her in my arms and bore her to one of the benches at the side of the room. 
Again, no Martian interfered with me, and tearing a piece of silk from my cape, I endeavored to staunch the flow of blood from her nostrils. I was soon successful as her injuries accounted to little more than an ordinary nosebleed, and when she could speak, she placed her hand upon my arm and looked up into my eyes and said, Why did you do it? You who refused me even friendly recognition in the first hour of my peril, and now you risk your life and kill one of your companions for my sake. I cannot understand. What strange manner of man are you, that you could sort with the green men, though your form is that of my race, while your color is little darker than that of the white ape? Tell me, are you human, or are you more than human? It is a strange tale, I replied, too long to attempt to tell you now, and one which I so much doubt the credulity of myself that I fear to hope that others will permit it. Suffice it, for the present, that I am your friend, and so, far as our captors will permit, your protector and your servant. Then you too are a prisoner. But why, then, those arms and the regalia of a Thracian chieftain? What is your name? What is your country? Yes, Dejah Thoris, I too am a prisoner. My name is John Carter, and I claim Virginia, one of the United States of America, Earth, as my home. But why I am permitted to wear arms, I do not know, nor was I aware that my regalia was that of a chieftain. We were interrupted at this juncture by the approach of one of the warriors, bearing arms and accoutrements and ornaments, and in a flash one of her questions was answered and a puzzle cleared up for me. I saw that the body of my dead antagonist had been stripped, and I read in the menacing yet respectful attitude of the warrior who had brought me these trophies of the kill, the same demeanor as that evinced by the other who had brought me my original equipment. And now for the first time I realized that my blow, on the occasion of my first battle in the audience chamber, had resulted in the death of my adversary. The reason for the whole attitude displayed toward me was now apparent. I had won my spurs, so to speak, in the crude justice which always marks Martian dealings, and which, among other things, has caused me to call her the planet of paradoxes. I was accorded the honors due a conqueror, the trappings, and the position of the man I killed. In truth, I was a Martian chieftain, and this I learned later was the cause of my great freedom and my toleration in the audience chamber. As I had turned to receive the dead warrior's chattels, I had noticed that Tars Tarkas and several others had pushed forward toward us, and the eyes of the former rested upon me in a most quizzical manner. Finally, he addressed me. You speak the tongue of Barsoom quite readily for one who was deaf and dumb to us a few short days ago. Where did you learn it, John Carter? You yourself are responsible, Tars Tarkas, I replied, in that you furnish me with an instructress of remarkable ability. I have to thank Sola for my learning. She has done well, he answered, but your education in other respects needs considerable polish. Do you know what your unprecedented temerity would have cost you had you failed to kill either of the two chieftains whose medal you now wear? I presume that that one whom I had failed to kill would have killed me, I answered, smiling. No, you are wrong. Only in the last extremity of self-defense would a Martian warrior kill a prisoner. We'd like to save them for other purposes. And his face bespoke possibilities that were not pleasant to dwell upon. But one thing can save you now, he continued. Should you, in recognition of your remarkable valor, ferocity, and prowess, be considered by Tal Halius as worthy of his service, you may be taken into the community and become a full-fledged Tharkian. Until we reach the headquarters of Tal Halius, it is the will of Lorcas Potomel that you be accorded the respect your acts have earned you. You will be treated by us as a Tharkian chieftain, but you must not forget that every chief who ranks you is responsible for your safe delivery to our mighty and most ferocious ruler. I am done. I hear you, Tars Tarkas, I answered. But as you know, I am not of Barsoom. Your ways are not my ways, and I can only act in the future as I have in the past, in accordance with the dictates of my conscience and guided by the standards of mine own people. If you will leave me alone, I will go in peace. But if not, let the individual Barsoomians with whom I must deal either respect my rights as a stranger among you or take whatever consequences may befall. 
of one thing, let us be sure, whatever may be your ultimate attentions toward this unfortunate young woman, whoever would offer her injury or insult in the future must figure on making a full accounting to me. I understand that you belittle all sentiments of generosity and kindliness, but I do not. And I can convince your most doughty warrior that these characteristics are not incompatible with an ability to fight. Ordinarily, I am not given to long speeches, nor even before had I descended to bombast. But I had guessed at the keynote, which would strike an answering chord in the breasts of the Green Martians. Nor was I wrong, for my harangue evidently deeply impressed them, and their attitude toward me thereafter was still further respectful. Tars Targus himself seemed pleased with my reply, but his only comment was more or less enigmatic. And I think I know Tal Halius Yedek of Thark. I now turned my attention to Dejah Thoris, and assisting her to her feet, I turned with her toward the exit, ignoring her hovering guardian harpies as well as the inquiring glances of the chieftains. Was I not now a chieftain also? Well then, I would assume the responsibilities of one. They did not molest us, and so Dejah Thoris, Princess of Helium, and John Carter, Gentleman of Virginia, followed by the faithful Wula, passed through utter silence from the audience chamber of Lord Cospotomel, Yed, among the Tharks of Barsoom. Chapter 11 With Dejah Thoris As we reached the open, the two female guards who had been detailed to watch over Dejah Thoris hurried up and made as though to assume custody of her once more. The poor child shrank against me, and I felt her two little hands fold tightly over my arm. Waving the women away, I informed them that Sola would attend the captive hereafter, and I further warned Sarkoya that any more for cruel attentions bestowed upon Dejah Thoris would result in Sarkoya's sudden and painful demise. My threat was unfortunate and resulted in more harm than good to Dejah Thoris, for as I learned later, men do not kill women upon Mars, nor women men. So Sarkoya merely gave us an ugly look and departed to hatch up deviltries against us. I soon found Sola and explained to her that I wished her to guard Dejah Thoris as she had guarded me, that I wished her to find other quarters where they would not be molested by Sarkoya, and I finally informed her that I myself would take up my quarters among the men. Solia glanced at the accoutrements which were carried in my hand and slung across my shoulder. You are a great chieftain now, John Carter, she said, and I must do your bidding, though indeed I am glad to do it under any circumstances. The man whose medal you carry was young, but he was a great warrior, and had by his promotions and kills won his way close to the rank of Tars Tarkas, who, as you know, is second to Lord Cospotomel only. You are eleventh, but there are but ten chieftains in this community who rank you in prowess. And if I should kill Lorcos Potomel, I asked? You would be first, John Carter. But you may only win that honor by the will of the entire council that Lorcos Potomel meets you in combat, or should he attack you, you may kill him in self-defense and thus win first place. I laughed and changed the subject. I had no particular desire to kill or cost Potomel, and less to be a Jed among the Tharks. I accompanied Solia and Dejah Thoris in a search for new quarters, which we found in a building near the audience chamber, and a far more pretentious architecture than our former habitation. Vasa found in this building real sleeping apartments with ancient beds of highly wrought metal swinging from enormous gold chains depending from the marble ceilings. The decoration of the walls was most elaborate, and unlike the frescoes in the other buildings I had examined, portrayed many human figures in the composition. These were of people like myself, and of a much lighter color than Dejah Thoris. They were clad in graceful flowing robes, highly ornamented with metal and jewels, and their luxuriant hair was of a beautiful golden and reddish bronze. The men were beardless, and only a few wore arms. The scenes depicted for the most part a fair-skinned, fair-haired people at play. Dejah Thoris clasped her hands with exclamation of rapture she gazed upon these magnificent works of art, wrought by a people long extinct, while Sola, on the other hand, apparently did not see them. We decided to use this room, on the second floor and overlooking the plaza, for Dejah Thoris and Sola, and another room adjoining in the rear for the cooking and supplies. 
I then dispatched Sola to bring the bedding and such food and utensils as she might need, telling her that I would guard Dejah Thoris until her return. As Sola departed, Dejah Thoris turned to me with a faint smile. And where to then would your prisoner escape should you leave her, unless it was to follow you and crave your protection, and ask your pardon for the cruel thoughts she has harbored against you these past few days? You are right, I answered. There is no escape for either of us unless we go together. I heard your challenge to the creature you call Tars Tarkas, and I think I understand your position among these people. But what I cannot fathom is your statement that you are not of Barsoom. In the name of my first ancestor, then, she continued, where may you be from? You are like unto my people, and yet so unlike. You speak my language, and yet I heard you tell Tars Tarkas that you had but learned it recently. All Barsoomians speak the same language from the ice-clad south to the ice-clad north, though their written languages differ. Only in the Valley Dor, where the river East empties into the La Sia Chorus, is there supposed to be a different language spoken. And except in the legends of our ancestors, there is no record of a Barsoomian returning up the river Is from the shores of Chorus in the Valley of Dor. Do not tell me that you have thus returned. They would kill you horribly anywhere upon the surface of Barsoom if that were true. Tell me it is not. Her eyes were filled with a strange, weird light. Her voice was pleading, and her little hands reaching up upon my breast was pressed against me as though to wring a denial from my very heart. I do not know your customs, Dejah Thoris, but in my own Virginian, a gentleman does not lie to save himself. I am not of Dor. I have never seen the mysterious Is. The Lossy of Chorus is still lost, so far as I am concerned. Do you believe me? And then it struck me suddenly that I was very anxious that she should believe me. It was not that I feared the result which would follow a general belief that I had returned from the Barsoomian heaven or hell or whatever it was. Why was it then? Why should I care what she thought? I looked down at her, her beautiful face upturned and her wonderful eyes opening up the very depth of her soul, and as my eyes met hers, I knew why, and I shuddered. A similar wave of feeling seemed to stir her. She drew away from me with a sigh, and her earnest, beautiful face turned up to mine. She whispered, I believe you, John Carter. I do not know what a gentleman is, nor have I ever heard before of Virginia. But on Barsoom no man lies. If he does not wish to speak the truth, he is silent. Where is this Virginia, your country, John Carter? She asked, and it seemed that this fair name of my fair land had never sounded more beautiful than as it fell from those perfect lips on that far-gone day. I am of another world, I answered. The great planet Earth, which revolves about our common sun and next within the orbit of your Barsoom, which we know as Mars. How I came here I cannot tell you, for I do not know. But here I am, and since my presence has permitted me to serve Dejah Thoris, I am glad that I am here. She gazed at me with troubled eyes, long and questioningly. That it was difficult to believe my statement, I well knew. Nor could I hope that she would do so however much I craved her confidence and respect. I would much rather not have told her anything of my antecedents, but no man could look into the depths of those eyes and refuse her slightest behest. Finally, she smiled and rising said, I shall have to believe even though I cannot understand. I can readily perceive that you are not of the Barsoom of today. You are like us, yet different. But why should I trouble my poor head with such a problem when my heart tells me that I believe because I wish to believe? It was good logic, good, earthly, feminine logic, and if it satisfied her, I certainly could pick no flaws in it. As a matter of fact, it was about the only kind of logic that could be brought to bear upon my problem. We fell into a general conversation then, asking and answering many questions on each side. She was curious to learn of the customs of my people and displayed a remarkable knowledge of events on earth. When I questioned her closely of the seeming familiarity with earthly things, she laughed and cried out, Why, every schoolboy on Barsoon knows the geography. 
and much concerning the fauna and flora, as well as the history of your planet fully as well as of his own. Can we not see everything which takes place upon earth, as you call it? Is it not hanging there in the heavens in plain sight? This baffled me, I must confess, fully as much as my statements have confounded her, and I told her so. She then explained in general the instruments her people had used and been perfecting for ages, which permitted them to throw upon a screen a perfect image of what is transpiring upon any planet and upon many of the stars. These pictures are so perfect in detail that, when photographed in large objects no greater than a blade of grass may be distinctly recognized. I afterward, in helium, saw many of these pictures as well as the instruments which produced them. If then you are so familiar with earthly things, I asked, why is it that you do not recognize me as identical with inhabitants of that planet? She smiled again as one might in bored indulgence of a questioning child. Because, John Carter, she replied, nearly every planet and star having atmospheric conditions at all approaching those of Barsoom shows forms of animal life almost identical with you and me. And further, earth men, almost without exception, cover their bodies with strange, unsightly pieces of cloth, and their heads with hideous contraptions, the purpose of which we have been unable to conceive, while you, when found by the Tharkian warriors, were in entirely undisfigured and unadorned. The fact that you wore no ornaments is a strong proof of your unbarsumian origin, while the absence of grotesque coverings might cause a doubt as to your earthliness. I then narrated the details of my departure from the earth, explaining that my body there lay fully clothed in all the, to her, strange garments of mundane dwellers. At this point, Sola returned with our meager belongings and her young Martian protege, who, of course, would have to share the quarters with them. Sola asked us if we had had a visitor during her absence, and she seemed much surprised when we answered in the negative. It seemed that as she had mounted the approach to the upper floors where our quarters were located, she had met Sarkoya descending. We decided that she must have been eavesdropping, but as we could recall nothing of the importance that had passed between us, we dismissed the matter as of little consequence, merely promising ourselves to be warned to the utmost caution in the future. Deja Thoris and I then fell to examining the architecture and decorations of the beautiful chambers of the building we were occupying. She told me that these people had presumably flourished over a hundred thousand years before. They were the early progenitors of her race, but had mixed with the other great race of early Martians, who were very dark, almost black, and also with the reddish-yellow race, which had flourished at the same time. These three great divisions of the higher Martians had been forced into a mighty alliance as the drying up of the Martian seas had compelled them to seek the comparatively few and always diminishing fertile areas and to defend themselves under new conditions of life against the wild hordes of green men. Ages of close relationship and intermarrying had resulted in the race of red men, of which Dejah Thoris was a fair and beautiful daughter. During the ages of hardships and incessant warring between their own various races as well as with the green men, and before they had fitted themselves to the changed conditions, much of the high civilization and many of the arts of the fair-haired Martians had become lost. But the red race of today had reached a point where it feels that it had made up in new discoveries and in more practical civilization for all that lies irretrievably buried with the ancient Barsoonians beneath the countless intervening ages. These ancient Martians had been a highly cultivated and literary race, but during the vicissitudes of those trying centuries of readjustment to new conditions, not only did their advancement and production cease entirely, but practically all their archives, records, and literature were lost. Deja Thoris related many interesting facts and legends concerning this lost race of noble and kindly people. She said that the city in which we were camping was supposed to have been a center of commerce and culture known as Korad. It had been built upon a beautiful natural harbor landlocked by magnificent hills. The little valley on the west front of the city, she explained, was all that remained of the harbor, while the pass through the hills to the old sea bottom had been the channel through which the shipping passed up to the city gates. The shores of the ancient seas were dotted with just such cities, and lesser ones, 
in diminishing numbers were to be found converging toward the center of the oceans, as the people had found it necessary to follow the receding waters until necessity had forced upon them their ultimate salvation, the so-called Martian canals. We had been so engrossed in exploration of the building and in our conversation that it was late in the afternoon before we realized it. We were brought back to a realization of our present conditions by a messenger bearing a summons from Lord Caz Potemel, directing me to appear before him forthwith, bidding Dejah Thoris and Sola farewell, and commanding Wula to remain on guard. I hastened to the audience chamber, where I found Lorquas, Potemel, and Taurus Tarkas seated upon the rostrum. This has been a Colby Cast episode. This work is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non Commercial No Derivatives License. Share it, link it, blog it, talk about it. As Woody Guthrie said, this song is copyrighted in the U.S. under seal of copyright number 154085 for a period of 28 years. And anybody caught singing it without our permission will be a mighty good friend to Arn because we don't give a darn. Publish it, write it, sing it, swing to it, yodel it. We wrote it, that's all we wanted to do.